Over all of the episodes that I have talked about here on the podcast, I don't think that we have ever covered one that is quite like this one in so many ways. This week we are going to talk about a young woman who went missing not once, not twice, but three different times within her life, and sadly she has not been heard of or found since her last disappearance. This is a case that covers a contentious, with some people, diagnosis, a young woman who seemed truly and wholly like the best person that anyone could ever meet, and a story that has as many twists and turns as one could possibly handle. Hello, my name is Lance, and welcome to episode 128 of Gone But Never Forgotten, searching for a woman who may not know that she is missing. The Disappearance of Hannah Up. Hannah Emily Up grew up with her family in a small town in Oregon. She at first lived with her mother Barbara, her father David, and her brother Dan. Both of her parents were ministers that worked at a Japanese-American church. Barbara, who was American, was fluent in Japanese and she was very involved in the church and within the church and the Japanese community. It is said that the family was very strict when it came to Christian values. However, since I know that those words can make some people cringe, I will point out that there has been no reports from the family nor anyone else that there was any kind of abuse that tagged along with that label. When Hannah was 15 years old, her mother Barbara would file for divorce because of seemingly irreconcilable differences that seemed to stem from a lot of difference in religious views between herself and David. After the divorce, David would go overseas and remain there, where he would minister while moving around from country to country quite often, seemingly in the position that many of us would call akin to a missionary. David was very much a one-book Christian, and that means that he believed that the Bible was literally the only text that anyone needed within their lives, and that the words within it could help you in any and every situation. Hannah, along with Barbara and Dan, would move to a small Quaker community that was just outside of Philadelphia, and that was where Barbara would ultimately go to teach at Pendle Hill. Pendle Hill is a Quaker study, retreat, and conference center that offers programs that are open to people of all faiths. These programs include residential study programs, online and on-campus short-term courses and retreats, conference services, leadership training, and so much more. For those who don't know, Quakers are a group of people who belong to what is called the Religious Society of Friends, which is historically a Protestant Christian set of denominations. Quakers are generally united by the belief that every person has the ability to experience the light within, and that everyone has God inside of them. Quakers seek to experience God directly within themselves and in all relationships that they have with others in the world around them. Quakers find the life and teachings of Jesus to be inspirational, but they do not believe that they have any creed. They are usually more concerned with emulating Jesus' life and obeying his commands than they are with the theology of salvation. 
Quakers also believe that all human beings are inherently good. Hannah herself seems to be conflicted with her own religious views, as often through her life, as we will see, she would explore and open her mind to many different religions, sects, dogmas, and beliefs. Even though she seemed to drift away from the Christian values that had been a major part of her life growing up within the church, she did certainly see herself as a daddy's girl, and she would travel to visit him seemingly every year, wherever he was stationed. David would later say that he and Hannah had spent time together in 25 different countries. Hannah would tell people throughout her life that she was much more drawn and enamored to the Quaker community and way of believing than she was the traditional Christian way of life. She found that people in the Quaker community were much less judgmental and much more open to life itself. Friends and family always described Hannah as fun and energetic. She was also described as incredibly bright and intuitive, and she was incredibly thoughtful. It was said that everyone that came into contact with Hannah loved her. It was nearly impossible not to. She had an incredibly high level of energy, and she was always on the go. It was also said that she was one of the kindest people that anyone would ever meet. Hannah would leave the Quaker community to attend Bryn Mawr, which is a liberal arts college just outside of Philadelphia. And it was there that she seemingly started to struggle a bit with finding out who she was at her core and away from family and the influence of the church. While she was at college, a Christian speaker would come and speak, and she found out that the speaker had been essentially excommunicated from her church and denomination, all because it became known that she was a lesbian. Not long after that, Hannah would actually admit to people that she believed that she too was a lesbian, or at least bisexual and she admitted that she was dating another woman. Friends would say that that was par for the course for Hannah. Whenever she heard about something, and whenever she went somewhere new, she would become completely absorbed with that. It would essentially take over her life, so to speak. In the summer of 2008, having completed college, Hannah, then 23 years old, was getting ready to start her career as a middle school teacher at Thurgood Marshall Middle School in Harlem, New York. At the time, she was living with a roommate, and she was seemingly enjoying living in New York and enjoying all of the things that New York has to offer. Hannah was also becoming very aware of social and economic issues, especially as she prepped to teach in Harlem, and she had even started to attend Freegan's meetings. Freegan's are a group of people who meet to discuss ways to reduce the usage of resources so that there's more for everyone. Hannah had started to purchase and garner food from grocery stores that was unsellable because of damage, so that there was more available for everyone else. Again, we see Hannah here kind of diving into whatever was available, as she seemingly was always on this hunt for who she was, or at the very least for what was at the center of her being. On August 28th of 2008, Hannah would leave her house to go for a run. It was the day before classes were to start, and on the first day of school, Hannah was noted to be absent. When word got out, friends and family started to attempt to get in touch with Hannah. It was quickly discovered that inside of Hannah's bedroom were her wallet, her passport, her cell phone, and her purse, all on the floor. Almost immediately, Hannah's disappearance was looked at by investigators as a homicide. It would be a couple of weeks before there was anything of a lead within the case. Investigators had literally nothing to go on, and Barbara and others would paper everywhere with missing person posters in hopes that someone would see something. And finally, they did. 
A tip was called in that Hannah, or someone who looked very much like Hannah, had been seen at an Apple store in Midtown Manhattan. The woman in question was seen in a sports bra, running shorts, and her hair was all done up in a bun. The woman would quickly go to a computer, check her Gmail account, and then log out and leave the store, but not before she had an interaction with someone in that store. When Barbara was shown the surveillance footage and she watched the interaction with the man who had asked Hannah if she was the missing person, she knew that it was Hannah because of the way that she responded. Hannah had told the man that she wasn't the missing person and that she was fine and Barbara said that she recognized Hannah because of mannerisms and actions with her hands and body that Hannah would use. Two days later, Hannah was again seen, this time at a Starbucks in Soho, Manhattan. But when the tip was called in, Hannah would leave through the back door of the coffee shop before the police arrived on the scene. She was also seen at five different chains of sports clubs in New York in the time that she was missing. It was believed that she was attending the sports clubs to shower and freshen herself up. Hannah had given her name, curiously, when she had checked in to those sports clubs. Finally, on September 16th, 20 days after Hannah had first gone missing, a captain on board of a Staten Island ferry and his crew would notice a woman floating face down in the water near the southern edge of Manhattan. The crew, of course, believed that the woman was certainly dead, as it seemed that she was not making any effort at all to keep her head above water or sustain herself. However, when they pulled her from the water, Hannah took a sharp intake of breath and everyone was shocked to see that she was still alive. This woman, which was Hannah, was treated for hypothermia, dehydration, and a severe sunburn. The woman, though, had no recollection of where she had been for the past three weeks, but she did seem to remember her life pretty quickly from before the three weeks that she had been missing. The woman was indeed Hannah Up. She would tell police that in her mind she had gone from leaving her home for a run to being inside of an ambulance, which is frightening. Three weeks to her seemed like ten minutes. Over time, Hannah would remember small details of the time that she was gone, but very close to when she was discovered. She said that she remembered being in the river, and she remembered that she had grabbed onto the back of a barge to get a rest from swimming. But she had let go after she realized that she was being pulled towards the propeller of the barge. So she had let go and swam away. Ultimately, Hannah would be diagnosed with, as I said off the top, to many is a very contentious diagnosis. She was diagnosed as having suffered from dissociative fugue. Dissociative fugue is also known as Jason Bourne syndrome, for those of you that are fans of movies and of the Bourne series, and It is a very rare psychiatric phenomenon that is characterized by reversible amnesia for one's identity in tandem with unexpected wandering or travel. Fugue can sometimes be accompanied also with the establishment of a new identity. Fugue is usually caused by trauma, most often sexual or physical abuse or a combat experience, or exposure to a natural disaster. It can also be caused because of an unbearable internal conflict. Fugue is one of those conditions that is contentious, because if you don't try to understand it, it can honestly just come across as though someone is lying, and they tried to escape their life in some shape or fashion, And conversely, if you do try to understand it, it can be incredibly difficult to comprehend. Hannah's mom perhaps put it best when she said that as she tried to learn about dissociative fugue, she felt that the more that she researched, the less that she understood it. 
even though Fugue has been written about in psychology texts for hundreds of years, it really isn't something that can be backed up by any of the guidelines that we base most of our medical knowledge upon. The idea that someone can seemingly forget everything and then in a moment remember their past life while forgetting the in-between time is very much beyond the edge of our knowledge, or so it seems. As you can imagine, many of the people that investigated Hannah's case, and certainly many members of the public at large that followed along with it, did not believe the story at all. People believed that she had known who she was all along, and was likely either trying to escape her life or commit suicide. It's hard to imagine how all of those beliefs that she was being deceitful would have made Hannah feel after already experiencing a very traumatic event. At best, she was being called out for being caught in her lies, but most likely, at worst, she was being called a liar when she herself truly had no knowledge of what had gone on. After seeking out many counselors and psych psychiatrists and psychotherapists and really everything in between, Hannah ultimately decided that she wanted to put the entire incident behind her. She decided that she didn't want to be defined as the teacher who had gone missing, and she didn't want to waste any more of her life trying to unlock answers that she was truly believing were not there. Hannah was told by many doctors that it was incredibly unlikely and probably impossible that she would ever fall into a fugue state again. So, Hannah tried her best to move on with her life. It was generally believed that rather than creating a new persona when she was in her fugue state, Hannah had instead dwelled in something of a state of nothingness. It was believed that she had given the name Hannah, and she had logged into her email perhaps more from something that was akin to muscle memory than because she knew who she was, and she knew what was happening within her and within her life. About a year after she was discovered, Hannah would decide to return to Pendle Hill with her mom, and she would stay there and work for approximately three years. This was likely just a return to some sense of normalcy, as well as a return to safety, because she was close to her mother, and close to people that knew her, and knew of her story, and did not judge her for what she had been through. Quaker values and their way of life and seeing everyone as an equal would certainly be appealing to someone that was being called a liar by seemingly everyone. After spending those three years back at Pendle Hill, Hannah would take a job working as a teaching assistant at a Montessori school for underserved children in Kensington, Maryland. Hannah threw herself into learning Montessori, internalizing it, and loving it. Montessori education is an educational approach that was developed by Dr. Maria Montessori, an Italian physician. The Montessori method fosters rigorous, self-motivated growth for children and adolescents in all areas of their development, including cognitive, emotional, social, and physical. It emphasizes independence and freedom within limits and also respect for a child's natural development. Again, I can't help myself here but see that this was Hannah diving into yet another doctrine and yet another way of life as fast and as deeply as she could, and she embraced it. She was constantly looking for that one thing that would ultimately make sense and ultimately click for her to make her feel at home and make her feel as though she had found her place and found her thing. This was a kind-hearted woman, as I said, by all accounts, and it seemed as though she truly had a heart and a passion for children, something that I dare say is lacking in many teachers today and, in fact, for humanity as a whole. She just wanted to do what was right for everyone, all the time, including herself, and she was on that 
constant journey to figure out what that was. In September of 2013, the day before her first day as a teaching assistant at the school, though, Barbara would receive a phone call that was hauntingly familiar. Hannah's purse, wallet, and cell phone were all found in a wooded area of Kensington. One of Hannah's co-workers had said that as she was driving to work, she had seen Hannah walking very quickly and in the opposite direction of the school. Barbara and her friends from Pendle Hill would come quickly to Maryland, and they started to search and put flyers up around town. It was discovered that Hannah had not slept at her home the previous night, and it was also discovered that nobody had spoken to Hannah for approximately 24 hours before she had disappeared. Around 10.30 the next morning, Barbara received a phone call from an unknown number, and when she picked up the phone, it was Hannah on the other line. All that Hannah said at first was, Mom? Hannah had evidently found herself in a dirty creek in a residential area of Wheaton, Maryland, approximately a mile and a half from the school that she was to teach at. Hannah had realized what was happening and gone into the residential area and borrowed a phone to call her mom. A friend of hers would say that it was as though Hannah had been wandering and then she had been sucked back into her body. It was like she was just instantly Hannah again. This time, as everyone tried to piece together the time before Hannah had gone off the grid, they looked at her text messages. Hannah said that she remembered sending many of the text messages at the beginning of the day, and then suddenly there was just a time when she did not remember any of the text messages that were sent from her phone. There were some similarities between the two disappearances. Both of them happened at the start of the school year, and both of the disappearances were soon after she had visited her father in another country. David had said that he does not believe that either of the visits were a stressful trigger for Hannah because it was far from something that they had only done a time or two. Hannah would, however, say that every time she came home from a trip to see her father, even though she had been heading home, it oftentimes didn't feel like heading home because she was returning to a familiar place, but she was often in love with the place that she was coming back from. In both of her fugues, she was also strangely and inexplicably drawn to water. Only a few days after this disappearance, Hannah would return to work, and the following year she was hired for a job as a teaching assistant for preschoolers at a Montessori school in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It seems that even though Hannah was moving around a lot and often diving into new dogmas and ways of life, one thing always stayed true. Hannah was an incredible human being. In her first year at St. John, she was referred to by a parent as a modern-day Mary Poppins, and everyone still regarded her as a bubbly, energetic young woman who truly lived to love and help. It didn't take long for Hannah to engross herself in life living on St. John. She said that it was her paradise, and with a population of less than 5,000 people, it seemed that much of the people who lived there knew of Hannah. Hannah developed and made some really strong friendships while she lived there, and many people say in hindsight that they would talk to Hannah for hours, and they would come away feeling refreshed, only to later realize that Hannah had shared little to nothing about herself. Interestingly, seemingly as a part of this transition to her new life, Hannah made the decision to not tell anyone about her previous disappearances and her diagnosis of fugue. The school realized that they had what they had in Hannah, and they paid for her to take summer classes at a Montessori training center in Portland because they wanted her to be able to teach rather than continue being a teaching assistant. Hannah was said to have absorbed everything in her summer classes, and she truly was taking on the Montessori way of life. 
A friend even said that he believed that Hannah had found her new church in the Montessori teachings. There was a book, and there were rules. And if you followed the rules, good things would happen to good people. It really does seem like those principles were appealing to Hannah in almost every dogma that she chose to pursue. In September of 2017, Hannah had finished her Montessori degree and she'd been teaching on St. John for four years in different capacities, and then tragedy would strike. Hurricane Irma would hit and devastate St. John. People would say that instantly the paradise had gone from being luscious and green to brown and destroyed. The leaves were gone, the the trees were down, and there was so much destruction to the island. Many people truly believe that the idea of St. John was forever destroyed. Six days after the storm, Hannah would drive to the home of her ex-boyfriend, Joey Spolino and she saw that his belongings were all gone from his home. The landlord had told Hannah that he was rushing to the marina to get on a mercy ship that was giving people free rides away from the island. Not only had Hurricane Irma destroyed the island, but now a second storm, another Category 5 storm, Hurricane Maria, was being forecast to hit St. John in a week's time. Hannah drove to the marina in a rush to see and say goodbye to Joey, and even though the two joked about her leaving the island with him, she ultimately told him that she didn't have a desire to leave. The next day, she was back at the Montessori school and helping to prepare the school for the second incoming storm. Her co-worker that she was working with would later note that Hannah was seemingly not really herself. She was answering questions and requests with simple yeses and noes, which was out of character for Hannah. The co-worker said that Hannah was usually very inquisitive, wanting to know why they were doing the things that they were doing. The co-worker, no doubt, believed that the tragedy and the risk of another tragedy were the causes to the change of Hannah's tone and tenor. Later that evening, Hannah's roommates had decided that they were going to seek transport off of the island before the second hurricane hit. Hannah, when asked if she would do the same, said that she was going to stay. She said that she felt that the school was going to be the first step towards normalcy for many of the children on the island, and she wanted to be a part of that. The following morning... Hannah left a note that she was headed to the beach for a swim, and then she was going to the school and she got into her car and drove away. Hannah, though, did not show up at the school that day, and she missed a faculty meeting the following day. Needless to say, this was the same time of year that Hannah had experienced the fugues before, and she certainly would have had trauma after experiencing one hurricane and expecting a second. When Hannah was feared missing, her friends were given a weird set of directions. They were told to search near any body of water that was on or around the island. As I mentioned, seemingly nobody on St. John had ever been told about Hannah's previous life, and that included the fact that no one seemed to be aware of the dissociative fugue. When they were told this, Hannah's friends immediately went to Sapphire, which was Hannah's favorite beach. She often snorkeled there, and near the water at what used to be a beach bar before the storm, they found Hannah's sundress, sarong, sandals, and car keys. The belongings were found by construction workers, and inside of Hannah's car, which was in the parking lot, were her purse, her wallet, her passport, and her cell phone. The water would be searched extensively. The shoreline, a small island nearby that was swimmable, and the Coast Guard had even sent three helicopters to aid in the search. Hannah's name was also searched on all manifests for ships that had left from St. John, but there was seemingly no sign of Hannah anywhere. There was evidence that showed that Hannah had gone in and got into the water, 
but there was no proof that she had ever gotten out. It was said that the currents in the area were doing very strange things also after Hurricane Irma, with the currents sometimes reaching 10 miles per hour or almost 16 kilometers an hour. Unfortunately, the search had to be called off three days later in preparation for Hurricane Maria, and after the storm, the search of course continued in earnest. The waters were all checked again, as it was believed that if Hannah had drowned, her body would certainly wash ashore somewhere. The morgues, the hospitals, the beaches, the shelters, and really everywhere were checked in hopes of finding Hannah, whether she knew that she was Hannah or not. There really are three prevailing beliefs of what could have happened to Hannah. It was believed certainly by many that she had another fugue, and that she had wound up somewhere else and perhaps never snapped out of it. Fugues have been documented to last for years at times. Others believe that Hannah had purposely faked her own death, Obviously, that fits in line with people who believe that she had perhaps done that in the past. And finally, there is of course the possibility that a simple tragedy had struck while Hannah was swimming, and perhaps she got caught in a current that had ultimately taken her life. I should mention, though, that Hannah was an incredibly proficient swimmer. Many have said that she would enter a yearly swimming race on St. John, and she would finish the race up to 45 minutes before the rest of the racers. Barbara, as she had in the past, would come to the island and spend years there looking for Hannah. Coming to the spot that Hannah's belongings had been found and also driving Hannah's car in hopes of triggering a memory if Hannah saw her. Barbara certainly believes that Hannah is alive somewhere, and she refuses to believe that Hannah simply never got out of the water. Barbara says that Hannah's story is different. She says that Hannah had proven herself to be incredibly resilient, and that there are no limits as to where Hannah could be or what could have happened. There is also certainly proof that even all these years later, Hannah could snap out of her fugue and remember who she was. And that gives Barbara so much hope. She knows that literally any day could be the day that she hears from or sees her daughter again. The case is still open, as far as investigations go, as well, and they vow to keep the case open until it reaches a resolution in one way or another. Hannah Up disappeared on September 14th of 2017, and she was 32 years old at the time of her disappearance. She is Caucasian and 5 foot 7 inches in height. She would also now be 38 years of age. She weighed between 120 and 130 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She had brown hair and brown eyes and she had pierced ears and a pierced nose. Hannah was also fluent in Spanish and she had three tattoos. She has a triangle with a wave on the inside of her right ankle. She has a sunflower on her right thigh and she has a Venus symbol with an extra line on the left side of her lower torso. If you know someone that fits that description, or if you are someone with that description, especially with those tattoos, please reach out to the Virgin Islands Police Department and give them a tip. This story is crazy, and really made me think about the fact that we really and truly don't know anyone's story. I mean, Hannah had friends on the island that knew her, and really knew her, and were close friends, but didn't have a clue about the fact that she had disappeared twice before in the past and been diagnosed with dissociative fugue. Obviously, not only our friends, though. We pass by people every day who find themselves in desperate situations or suffering from mental health problems, and we have no idea what they are going through, or what they have gone through. It makes you really stop and think about all of the times that you perhaps judge other people or 
say cross words about other people when you don't know their story. Who knows if you have come across someone that's riddled with drug addiction or really has no idea who they are because of something like dissociative fugue. They say that they believe it affects two out of every 1,000 people. That is still a large number of people. For me, it serves as a harsh reminder. While the chances that I have passed by Hannah are obviously very slim, the chances that I have passed judgment on someone who may be experiencing what Hannah experienced are not so slim. I think we need to remember that we need to be slow to judge others and slow to pass judgment at all. Matthew chapter 12 verses 36 to 37 says, And I tell you this, you must give an account of every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. I can certainly say that I am judged guilty for many of the things that I have said under my breath or idly about others. We need to get better at that as a society for sure. You never know the story of the person you are talking about, even if you truly believe that you do. So, I'll leave you with that this week. I thank you, as always, for taking the time to listen to me and listen to Gone But Never Forgotten. Please come back next week, and may you truly do your best to be a part of the good and a part of the solution in this world. And of course, come back next week, and in the meantime, be better.